Oh, making me dizzy. Today's message is entitled Power-Filled Prayer. And before we start, let's pray so that my message will be filled with power. Father, we thank you. We thank you for all that you've done in and to and through us. Those that were here ministering in this, in this place that is so needy. Those that went um, and those that helped people go. God, we just pray that you bless each one. And God, I pray that that as we look at your word today and we finish up in the book of James, that you would speak to each one of us, that you would encourage us, that you would show us the power of prayer in more than one way. God, I pray that it would be just so ingrained in us that, that the fervent, effectual prayer of a righteous man avails much. God, I pray that we would remember that when we're going through the stuff. We'd know that we can depend upon you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. What is prayer? Now, I know we talked about prayer just a few weeks ago, and we talked about the power of a word, and that power of a word became really evident while we were on this trip. There were words that broke things off from people, and prayer is words. Whether you, whether you think them or you say them, prayer is nothing more, nothing less than having a conversation with God. That's prayer. We don't need to make it into some religious thing. It's talking to God. That's all it is. Now, do we have to have our hands folded and our heads bowed? I hope you don't do that if you're driving and praying, because everybody else should be praying if you're doing that while you're driving. And my Bible says, uh, watch and pray, so I don't know how you can watch with your eyes shut. So I don't think it's a bad thing to, to fold your hands, because now your hands are they're not fidgeting, they're not doing something else, and I don't think it's a bad thing to close your eyes, because perhaps you're less distracted. But it's not the formula. There is no formula on the right way to pray. Um, how many of you pray, say, grace before your meals? I don't think that's a bad thing. I don't know where it came from in the Bible other than Jesus prayed when he broke the bread. I think it's a good thing. It helps us to stop and remember and be thankful for what God has given us. But it's not, it's not a, again, it's not a formula, and it should not be the only time that we pray, that's for sure. And if, you, if you're going to say grace at home, you should, you should say grace at Chili's, at the Roadhouse, at wherever it is or else you go. If you, if you say grace, say grace. Uh, be like Brenda. Be a Browns fan. Say grace when it's not comfortable. Do you have to go into a prayer closet? How many of you actually have a closet that you go in and shut the door? Anybody? Nobody's going to admit it anyhow. I don't think it's a bad thing. It could be a very good thing to have a place where you, where you set aside a, a particular place to go and pray. Is that a bad thing? No, that's a good thing. These are all good things, but there's no formula. Do we have to pray using those words like thou and thee and thine? Please. Unless you use those words all the time, you ain't impressing nobody. Can I hear an Amen. So if you, if you do use those words all the time, God bless your pea-picking little heart, use them in prayer. I'm not going to pray that way. I'm going to pray just like I talk, even when I talk incorrectly. I'm just going to be real. I think God likes real. What do you think? I think he likes authentic. So if you say vehicle with an R and call it a vehicle, that that be the way you pray as well. If you pray to our Father in heaven, that's good. If that's how you say Father, like I used to. All it is is speaking. Speak. Words. Speak. There's power in your words. There's power in speaking. And we need to speak, not just think. Uh, there's a time to pray in your head. Amen? But there's power in words that are spoken. One of the things that makes it powerful is that who is the prince of the power of the air? Anybody know? Satan. But who has all authority been given to? Jesus. All authority has been given to Jesus, even over the prince of the power of the air, which is Satan. When you put words into the air, where are they going? Into the air. It's not a trick question. Who's the prince of the power of the air? You th it's like kind of poking him in the eye, I think. It's like there. See, I don't care if you're the prince of the power of the air. I'm related to the king of kings and the lord of lords, and you submit to him. Boom. You might even want to yell in your prayer. It's not a bad thing, you know. It's depending on where you are and what's going on, um, there are times when it is absolutely appropriate to get loud in your prayer. 
not because God can't hear, but because fervent, effectual prayer, earnest prayer is coming from your heart. And if you've got passion that needs to come out, be real. If you're angry at God, let him know. He can take it. He's a big, big God. He's not going to get all offended because you're mad at him. And sometimes you might even scream in prayer. Uh, I think I heard Angie praying at the, at the airport when I heard her screaming. Um, she was literally screaming at the airport. That's what happens when you go on these trips. People just come out of the woodwork and they do things they wouldn't normally do. But Angie's screaming at the airport. Why was Angie screaming at the airport? Because she needed help. I heard her screaming, help! I don't know if you remember screaming help, but you were. I mean, I was a long way away. So she's screaming help, and everybody's running, and I got, um, I got duty to watch the luggage so I couldn't move. I'm like, I don't know what's going on, but it ain't good. I felt this nausea in my stomach. Anybody ever felt that? Because when somebody you love is screaming help in a place they don't normally scream. So the rest of the story is that she, she um, lost her mind for a minute, did not be submitted to her husband because her husband said don't do that. She did it anyhow. She took her four-wheel walker and tried to go up the escalator and fell over backwards on the escalator. Now, her husband, the gallant man that he is, did the best he could to save her. Um, but I think it was Magenta, our 16-year-old girl, that actually probably saved her life because she had a word of knowledge. She knew how to shut the escalator off. There was no stop button. There's no... In the first place, there was no English. In the second place, there was no Spanish. There was no instructions at all to shut this thing off. All there was was a hole about that big at the top of the escalator down there. And she stuck her finger in there. I ain't sticking my finger in nothing in the Dominican Republic that I don't know what's in there. There's, there's bugs. There's spiders. There's, there's gears and stuff. Who knows? But she went down there and boom, stopped it. So God heard Angie's prayer her scream of help. Yes, it came in the form of Michael, but it also came in the form of a word of knowledge to a 16-year-old girl that did what she had to do. Now, Angie did not even get, a, well, she got scraped and scratched, but she's not sore. She doesn't have a bruise. On the other hand, Michael, her gallant husband who was trying to save her, bruised up both elbows, both knees, and hurt his shoulder. Should have just let her be, I guess. <laughs> So there's lessons to be learned about escalators and walkers. Um, anyhow, there was an elevator around the corner, just so you know. I, no excuses, Angie. It just is what it is. So you can scream your prayers. Anybody ever been in a place where, where they scream their prayers or yell their prayers? or This just so bad that all you can do is help. That's not a bad place. God knows your heart already. Let it out. Pray at all times. Paul tells us to pray at all times. So, which is better? The person who gets up in the morning and goes into their prayer closet and they're there for a half an hour, 45 minutes or an hour? Or the person who prays all day long when they're driving and they're sending little tweets to God, you know, bless me and protect them. And I don't know where that ambulance is going, but God have mercy. Which is better? Neither. They're both right. Let's do both. Let's find that quiet time. My wife and I are married, and we need quiet time together. We need that time when it's just the two of us. But we also have matured to the point where we're not stuck together at the waist like glue. She actually goes to work, and I go to work, and you know, we, we text or we call or whatever. We communicate on a regular basis, but it's not always in the prayer closet. It's not a bad place to be in the prayer closet. Our relationship needs intimate time, but it also, we live in a real world. So let's do both. And it's a two-way conversation with God. That's one of the things that I think most, or at least some, believers have a hard time dealing with. It's not just coming with your laundry list of, of wants, needs, and desires. And, um, you know, you got your checklist every day. You pray for this, 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 this. Now, if I came to my wife and every day I said the same things to her, honey, this, honey, that, and, and of course I used her name 18 times in every sentence. What? Of course. You know, Mary, would you please bless me? Mary, would you, Mary, oh Mary, would you please bless me? Now, let's just talk to God, okay? I'm not picking on anybody, but let's just talk to God. But, but 
our relationship, my relationship with God the Father needs to be similar to my relationship with my wife in that we have intimate times and we have other times, but our communication never stops. We have problems when our communication stops. When I forget to tell her things or she doesn't read my mind. I mean, it's a two-way conversation. So not only do you speak, but you listen. The story that Ed shared was such a powerful uh, example of listening. Because we had, we had kind of finished up. We'd prayed through this whole list of students from, that the school gave us. Students with special circumstances. Like one little girl who her dad was beating her. So we prayed for these kids by name. And we were done with that and we were kind of waiting for this. And, and uh, the choice was, well, we can just stay here and wait or we can go up into the village and pray. And we decided we'd go up in the village and pray. And we're driving towards the village. And it was really funny hearing it secondhand, of course. It's always better. But Aaron's sitting in the back seat. And we're driving past these houses. And God's speaking to his heart. Let's just pray here. But he's not driving. But we got about 30 yards further down the road. And Dr. Pensinger says, I think we should pray here. Nobody's ever gone here. So we stop back up and go in there. And that's where we find the woman that's hard of hearing. And I prophesied and didn't even know it. I said... Puedo or ir por ti, which is not correct. I should have said puedo, puedo or ar por ti. Or ir is can I hear for you? What I wanted to say was can we pray for you? And I said can we hear for you? That was that was pretty cool just in itself. And then the little girl she's yelling she can't hear. <laughs> So we go to this other house that wouldn't, we wouldn't have not even gotten there because we didn't have long. We probably would have never made it to this house had that not that hard of hearing woman been there that we had to yell at. And then we get in there, and what Ed didn't say was the, you, you saw a picture of a, of a pretty nice little house. This was a house. It uh, had no refrigerator. It had no stove. It had a little two burner thing on it. It had no cupboards. It had no food. And there's an elderly woman with her son who just, got, just quit school so that he could provide for her. Because there's no social security. There's no government anything. It's the community comes around, the family comes around, and that's the provision. So God led us there. And I'm kind of torn because wouldn't it have been awesome if we could have brought some provision? On the other hand, the most important, powerful thing that you could ever do for anybody is give them a word from God. Because if you feed somebody for a day, they're hungry tomorrow. But if you give them a word for God, it can sustain them for the rest of their lives. James 5, 13. Are any of you suffering hardships? Anybody? Well, you know what it says to do? You should pray. This is Bible. This isn't me making this up. It says you should pray. If you're suffering hardships, you should pray. Are any of you happy? Yay! You know what you should do? You should sing praises. You should pray because singing praises is the same thing as pray, praying. Praying, worshiping, praising is all the same. It's all communicating to God. It's all talking with God. So if you're happy, you should sing praises. If you're sick, what should you do? You should call the elders of the church to come and pray over you, anointing you with the oil in the name of the Lord. That's an interesting thing in our culture now. Um, it's not cool to call the old elders. It's cool to go to a place to get healed. It's cool to go see somebody that you don't even know and have them lay hands on you, which I, I don't know, maybe I'm a little weird. I don't want people that I don't know laying hands on me, honestly. So to go somewhere and get healing is not biblical. What's biblical is to call the elders of the church. And if anybody wants prayer today, I found this in my desk. I forgot I had it. This is oil from the Holy Land, and it's frankincense and myrrh. Must be special. It smells good. But you know what? The olive oil jug that's up here somewhere will work just as fine because the oil is symbolic only. And the word anoint, just so you know, if you get all freaked out about anointing, how many of you are charismatic Pentecostals that use the word anointing all the time? Do you know what it means? It literally means to smear. If you had toast for breakfast, you anointed it with butter or peanut butter or jelly or something this morning. So... You know, all it is is a word that means to smear. There's nothing 
magical or mystical about that word. So when you anoint somebody with oil, what do you do to them? You smear it on them. And, and I think if you were to study it out, people like uh, when, when Samuel came and anointed David with oil, he probably poured it over his head. How many of you are up for that? Is that worth getting healed? That's what it takes? So it's the elders of the church. Why the elders? Well, I think that there's a given that if you're an elder in a church, you should be recognized as somebody who's living the life that God has called you to live, is in right standing with God, is doing their best to follow him. So again, I think there's even a warning in this not to just have anybody lay hands on you and pray. You guys aren't very excited about that. You don't like your elders? I think they're awesome. Mike and Joe and Ben and Scott. You get better than that? Just so you know, guys, I, and I'm not sucking up to the elders. I don't work for them. I work with them. But they are the best elders that you could ask for. They really are. They're solid as a rock. They're not wishy-washy. They're not into weird fads and whims of doctrine. They're solid as a rock. And they have gifts that they probably don't even recognize that they bring to the table, but they do. They do. So you should thank them for being them and for being obedient because it's, it's uh, heavy sometimes, isn't it? Sometimes it's joyful and fulfilling, but sometimes it's heavy. So when you're sick, and this doesn't mean every time you get a sniffle, by the way. This means when you're sick. If, you, if you're sick, call forth the elders of the church and they will anoint you with oil, smear you, pour it over your head. Such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick and the Lord will make you well. And if you have committed any sins, you will be forgiven. So there's a question for you. If I've committed sins, does that make me sick? Maybe. It says if there, just so you know, if. If you've committed. So there may be a correlation between your spiritual life and your physical life. There may not be. To, to get locked into saying that, that you've, you've sinned like this, so this is a disease you have. Eh, I think that that's stretching it. On the other hand, if I go out and I drink way too much, tomorrow morning I might have a headache. Now, I know that that's a really kind of a simple picture, but my sin has caused me to be not feeling well, correct? You guys with me? This isn't, this is, I hope I'm not boring you. How many of you think church is boring? Anybody? If you do, it's your fault because you are the church. So quit being so boring. I don't think church is boring. I'm never bored at church. I have a party in my head if I have to. Look at that little circle with hands. Is sickness caused by sin? Sometimes, yes. But you can't say always. If you have sinned. Now, moving on, because this is where I really wanted to spend the time. Elijah was as human as we are. Don't you love that? I love the New Living Translation. He was a man just like you and I. In the Greek, it means that he had the same passions and desires as every other man. So Elijah. How many of you know about Elijah? He was quite a hero, wasn't he? He raised the dead. He did all kinds of wonderful things. He prayed, and we are, yet he, when he prayed earnestly that no rain would fall, none fell for three and a half years. <laughs> so if you go back to 1 Kings 17, it starts off verse 1. Elijah, the Tishbite. Doesn't say anything about him, where he came from. He just kind of appears on the scene. And this, this man, Elijah, goes before the king. We've never heard of him before. It's the first time he's ever mentioned in Scripture. He goes before the king and says, it's not going to rain until I say it does. Can you imagine the courage that that took? Can you imagine going down to Montpelier and knocking on Governor Scott's door? Hey, um... Just so you know, I know you don't know me. I'm a nobody, but it ain't going to rain in Vermont till I say it does. Can you imagine? Can you imagine what Vermont would look like in three and a half years without rain? Then, when he prayed again, the sky sent down rain, and the earth began to yield its crops. Now, the rest of the story in there, though, is that we don't even read about him praying beforehand. This is pretty cool. All we know is that he heard from God and he went and did it. So there is prayer going on because he heard from God. Remember, it's a two-way conversation. Right? It's not a one-way. So God spoke, Elijah obeyed. God said, go, he went. 
He said, tell the king this. He told the king this. When at the end of the three and a half years, in between, of course, he went and he, he lived by the brook Kidron and the crows fed him until the brook dried up and then he went and lived with a widow and he took the last of her food and ate it. Wasn't that nice of him? But God multiplied it. Now, she had some faith too. So, all of this happened. He, he, he raised the young man from the dead and then we end up with him at the Mount Carmel with the big showdown with the prophets of Baal. 450 prophets of Baal and him. I love this story. So, <laughs> it's, such a, it's such a funny thing when you read it, especially when you read it like in the message or the New Living Translation because it actually says what it says instead of making it sound nice for church people. Because they're doing all they're doing. They're jumping up and down. They're cutting themselves and they're screaming and yelling and hollering and all this stuff. And Elijah's like, um, maybe he went to the bathroom. He, that's what it says in the New Living. Maybe your God went to the bathroom. He's busy. He's on vacation. I don't know where he is, but he's not answering your prayer. So then Elijah, what does he do? After they're all done, he says, come on over here. So he comes over and what the first thing he does. Now this is, this is profound. First thing he does is repair the altar. See, it's not about jumping up and down and shouting and working yourself into a lather. It's about honoring God and making sure your heart's right. So he repaired the altar. He took the 12 stones and piled them back up. Then he dug a ditch. And, and I thought about this. You know, He asked them to pour water over this thing, not once, not twice, but four times in a drought. I mean, he, he's better come through now because he's just wasted all this water. It was, the drought was so bad that the king had set, sent Obadiah and himself out looking for a place where they could actually find a little grass for the animals. That's pretty bad. So in the meantime, he's dumping water on this altar, and he prayed, and he, even his prayer is cool. He's like, hey, God, um, this is my paraphrase, show them who you are. And it's all done. And then, he, of course, he girds up his loins. That means that he took his, he took his uh, clothes and wrapped them up so that he could run, and he ran ahead of the chariot all the way to Jezreel. Pretty wild, huh? In the mud, in the rain, because... Because he went and he prayed. And in his prayer, this time we do see him praying. We see him with his, it says he put his head between his knees. See, this is that closet time. This is that time when you've got to be in that place where it's nothing but you and God. There's no distractions. You're not driving. You're not, you got your head between your knees. What can you see with your head between your knees? Nothing. What are you going to hear? Not much. That's in that place that he was in. That's where the power came for him to be able to prophesy the rain. Because not only did he pray, he wasn't just talking to God. He was prophesying. He was speaking what God was saying. So in that place, he had the power to do all of that because he spent that quality time with God. He was a human, just like you and me. I love that because I don't think I'm too great. Do you? I'm not me, you. Your opinion of me really doesn't matter <laughs> in the big scheme of things. But how do you compare yourself to a man like Elijah? He did all these great miracles, but the Bible tells us he was a man just like you and I. He was no different. And Paul actually uses the same exact phrase when he's talking to the, those that wanted to make him God, him and Barnabas. And he said, no, we're just like you. We have the same passions and desires. We're, we're just people. Nothing special. Just like you and me. Yet he prayed and it didn't rain for three and a half years. Not only did he pray, he was obedient. Could it be that sometimes that's where we miss it? We pray, God says, do this, and we're like, nah, I don't know about that. That's kind of crazy. Why would any reasonable human being do something like that? Why would anybody reasonably go to the governor and tell him it's not going to rain? Well, you, you lost your mind, God. I ain't doing that. Can you have, have that conversation in your head? Say you go home, and, this, and tomorrow morning you wake up, and God puts it on your heart to go and, and tell the governor. Serious. I mean, it's, it's equivalent. It's not going to rain. What kind of a thinking process is in your head? Is it, okay, I'll go do it. I don't even know if I can honestly say, okay, I'll go do it. Because I've got this reasoning thing in my head that says, he, he's going to think I'm whacked. He's going to think I'm a nut job. He's going to think that, oh, another one of those guys. 
On the other hand, if I went and I proclaimed it and it stopped raining and snowing, it's just amazing what God might say to him three months from now, six months from now. By the time his term was ending, he'd probably be looking for me. God spoke, Elijah obeyed. One more story from our trip, and then I'll end. The woman who shared, her name is Teresa Young, she shared about uh, being healed as she prayed. She shared with us afterwards that 15 years ago or so, she was in a very bad place. Her husband had, had been arrested and was in jail for sexual stuff that was really nasty involving her son. So he's in jail. She's doing her best to be a God-honoring, God-fearing woman, trying to figure out, you know, do I stay with him? Do I leave? So she was still married to him for quite some time. Um, he reoffended and ended up back in jail, and finally she divorced him. In that whole process, we were ministering with her at one point in time, and God put it on her heart that someday she would stand beside us and pray and prophesy. Fifteen years ago, she forgot all about it. Because we moved, we left. It's like, well, guess that wasn't from you. So we get down there, and we end up in this, in the, and our plan was to pray and prophesy for every teacher and administrator, one-on-one. -on -one. And how many was there? 30 or so? 40? We ended up with four different teens, and they got into lines, and we prayed for each one. And she happened to be in our, in our line, just happened to be in our line, this teacher. And she comes up and she says, we asked her, is there anything we can pray for specifically? And she said, yeah, please pray for my brother. He's incarcerated. So I looked at Teresa and I said, Teresa, why don't you pray because you've been there. So Teresa began to pray and she broke and the woman broke. And such healing happened between in, in both of their hearts and such hope given to this woman. But what we didn't know was the healing that happened in Teresa's heart because she had carried so much, so much condemnation from people in the church for staying with him and then for divorcing him. No matter what she did, she was wrong. So she carried all of that stuff. She finally got to the place where she could let that go. And just knowing that God had ordained this very special time, 15 years earlier, he spoke it to her heart. He showed her this picture. And 15 years later, here we are. This woman happens to be in our line and happens to be the one who needs prayer from somebody who's had an incarcerated family member. Wow. Now, Teresa wasn't even going to go. She was, she was our last minute of the addition because we had somebody who dropped out. She wasn't going to go, and then she said yes, and then she, is a, she teaches teachers. She's a language, I don't know what she does, but she teaches at the college and she teaches in the school, works with the superintendent's office, does all kinds of that stuff. And she had all, it all arranged, and, they, and then they came to her and said, you can't have the time off. And she's like, now what do I do? She prayed, and she said, I'm going anyhow. So they ended up allowing her to go begrudgingly. So she went against all odds, spent the money to go, bought the, got the passport, got all the stuff. To get. So it's a couple thousand dollars. And the thing that came to my mind was that, that credit card commercial. All of this, $2,000. Being healed, set free, and seeing God work, priceless. Absolutely priceless. That woman came home different because she was obedient and paid the price to follow him. So when you obey, God does amazing things. When you disobey, she could have stayed home. She could have said, no, it's too hard. I can't afford it. It's too much. I got, she's got a daughter at home, and it's just too much. I can't do it. And then she would have missed out on the blessing. So when God speaks, obey. And then it goes on to say, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. The King James says it this way, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. The effective, fervent. What does that mean, effective, fervent? The earnest power of a righteous person, the earnest power, the, the effective, the, the passionate, the, the deep prayer that comes from within your heart, not your head. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You can go through your prayer list and you can pray down through this list for people and stuff. And, but when it comes from in here, when it's this deep, deep thing, it's your, your very being crying out. That, that type of prayer of a righteous person avails much, has wonder-working power. Now, who's righteous? Any of you righteous? 
What did you do to become righteous, Michael? You accepted Christ because we're having a blood drive coming up and 2,000 years ago, this man, Jesus Christ, he gave blood and he made him righteous, justified. He made me righteous because I, I received that free gift of salvation he gave me. That blood is the only thing that makes anybody righteous. Your, your righteousness, your good deeds are equal to dirty laundry. All the good stuff you do, not even the bad stuff, the good stuff you do. There's none righteous, no, not one, except for those that are in Christ. If you're in Christ, you're righteous. So if you've got this heart, this burden for prayer, and you're in Christ, guess what? Your prayer, according to the Scripture, is going to avail much. It's going to have a wonderful working power in it. I don't know what I'm going to have to do to get you guys excited, because that's exciting. I guess I could dance. If you're going through it, pray. If you're happy, pray. If you're happy and you know it, praise the Lord. If you're sick, what are you going to do? Call. Oh, you're not going to go some. You're going to ask the elders to pray for you. You might, you might go other places later. I don't know. But first, be obedient first to what the Scripture says. And it's really interesting reading the, passage, reading the commentaries about this because people try to explain away healing. Because there are those who don't believe that healing is for today. And I'm like, well, this is pretty black and white. Well, so they've got this great big long paragraph trying to explain what this doesn't mean. What it does mean is if you're sick, call the elders of the church. They will, they will anoint you with oil and pray for you and you will be healed. And it goes on to say, and your sins will be forgiven. Let's, let's try to figure out a way that doesn't work instead of trying to figure out a way it does. Let's do it and see what God does because he's able. He's more powerful than anything. If he wants to heal you, he can heal you. And it's not a matter of your faith, by the way. That's a lie straight from the pit of hell that puts condemnation on people. Yes, there is faith involved. There is an action on your part. But you can't heal yourself no matter how much you work yourself up. It ain't going to happen. Only God can heal, and God's going to heal when he wants to heal. Now, somehow in the midst of all of this stuff, I don't even know how it works, but you... But the story of Hezekiah comes to mind. God said, you're going to die. And Hezekiah prayed, and he didn't die. So somehow in the midst of all of that, somehow our prayers interact with the will of God. I don't know. I don't get it. But, but why not just be obedient and ask him and leave it in his hands? Ask by the prayer of faith. Who knows what God will do? I'm almost done. This is kind of a postscript in some ways. You can put it in. In the, pa in the greater passage, if, and you should, you should read all of, the, all of James 4 and 5 and include this. But I just want to encourage, I think that God had me include this, even though it's kind of a postscript to my message, because there are some in here that are discouraged about some lost people, some prodigals, somebody that used to be following Christ who no longer is. And it says, my dear brothers and sisters, if someone among you wanders away from the truth and is brought back, you can be sure that whoever brings that sinner back will save that person from death and bring about the forgiveness of many sins. So if, if you've been pursuing somebody who's fallen away, who's backslidden, if you've been praying for them, if the burden's on your heart, don't stop. Don't stop. Don't grow weary in well-doing because in due season you shall... Shall what? Reap a harvest. So don't be discouraged. Don't be discouraged. Yeah, you may not see it even in your lifetime, but don't be discouraged. Amen? And I'm going to close, and I'm only a little bit late. Is that okay? Thank you, Jesus. And at the end, the elders will be up here with my little special oil if you need prayer. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your goodness, for your glory. We thank you for all that you've done, all that you're doing. And God, we pray that even now that you would um, awaken us to pray. God, I pray that you would help us to find that quiet place where we can get intimate with you and also help us to remember to pray throughout our day, God, that you get glorified in it. God, I pray that we would begin to see amazing things happen. We begin to see you work in powerful ways. We, be, we begin to see healing of bodies. We begin to see healing of finances, of relationships, God, of, of our emotions, of our minds. God, I just pray that we begin to see healing after healing after healing so that you be glorified. God, we pray it all that the name of Jesus Christ would be lifted up and made famous. Amen. 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 Amen.